Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you this evening. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your fellowship and your family for this weekend. I've looked forward to this for some time. It's just a joy to be able to assemble together like this. Appreciate the songs that Devin led and appreciate the opportunity that we have to be together. I love young preachers. I guess as I'm getting a little bit older, I can say that. I love young men who have a desire to preach. I have a couple of young men that work with me at home. I just love and appreciate so much. I appreciate Devin's desire to, to preach the gospel and labor for the Lord. And I tell you, we have a number of young men among our fellowship of people that just do a marvelous, marvelous job. And I'm so excited about them and their work in the kingdom. And such a blessing to be with uh, Russ and Tracy. Uh, they're, bless their heart, housing me this weekend. And I appreciate their hospitality. Russ is such a dear, dear friend. And I enjoy being with them and, and love being in their home. It's just a joy to be with you this, week, this weekend. If you'd like to turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'd like to begin reading in verse 14. We'll read down to the end of the chapter. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over, the, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Much more those who received abundance of the grace of the gift of, righteous, the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In this great section of prose that Paul gives us in chapter 5, he speaks about sin that had entered the world and the condemnation that was introduced into the world as sin was introduced into the world by one man, Adam. And consequently, all that sin also experienced that same judgment of God. What was man to do? How can man ever set himself back in fellowship with God? Well, the good news is that there is a free gift offered. He calls it the free gift of grace. The free gift of grace that Jesus Christ came to offer to this world. But I want to pose a question as we begin. Several times this reading you have that expression, free gift, free gift of grace. But the question I want to ask is, is salvation really free? Is salvation really free? Is salvation something that, that we can amass enough wealth to at some point in time be able to pay God so we can be justified having paid him the debt because we've paid him the money? You know, there are a number of things in this world that people can do atrocious things, but if they have enough money, that money can buy them their freedom, right or wrong. But is there a place we can come that we say, Lord, I'll pay the cost. Let me pay, let me pay the cost. Let me pay for that. Well, we all know we'll never have enough money to be able to do that. And we all know that it wasn't ours in the beginning. Next, would we, able, would, we be, would we be able to come to a place where goodness, where we would attain such goodness in our lives that we'd be able to stand before God and say, I no longer need your free gift. 
I've attained this measure of goodness and now you can set me free. Again, we know the folly of that. You know, it might be that a certain person commits a crime and for years they go without being apprehended. They may even relocate to a different part of the state, maybe to a different country. But then somewhere, sometime, they make a mistake and they find themselves being recognized and then after years of being free, the crime they have committed, they're brought to justice. The argument is made, but I have lived a model life for the last 50 years, for the last 80 years. I've lived a model life. Why are you going to prosecute me for this crime that was committed back when I was so much younger? Does it matter that the individual committed murder in their 20s, but now then in their 70s, maybe their 80s, they're now apprehended and they no longer owe a debt for the crime they've been committed? Is the argument made that I've been so good? Justice can set me free because I have been so good. I have earned my justice. Well, again, we all know the folly of trying to stand before God and say, I now have lived so good, God. I have made peace with all the things I've done in my early life. I've now lived so good. You can give me salvation. I don't need your free gift any longer. We would say the person that would argue that way would be insane because we all know, regardless of how good we may ever get to be, we're never going to be good enough to stand before God and say, I don't need your free gift. The truth of the matter is this. We know there's no free lunch. You know, it's fascinating, and I'm not being critical of this, it's just the way it is. We're in the middle of tax season. And April 15th is the deadline by which we have to have our taxes paid. Now, if we have to pay anything into the system, little or much, we'll complain about that. But if we fill out our taxes and our accountant tells us, you're going to get so much back in return, we think, yes, I get that back. Wait a minute. You already paid that. We already paid that in. We're paying it in the right hand and getting in the left. There's no free lunch in that. There's not something now they're giving us a gift because there's some great graciousness now because the system wants to reward us. No, we've already paid that. The right hand pays, we receive it in the left. There's There's no free gift. We paid that in taxes somewhere along the way. And just as in life under the sun, there's no free gift. So it is true. There's no free gift with salvation either. Is salvation really free? Somebody paid the cost. And that somebody was Christ himself. We hear words about Christ and we hear a word called redemption. His blood was the ransom price for our redemption. That word redeem, redemption, is a foreign word to our vocabulary and to our minds today. It's a word that, yes, does have a dark history in the history of the United States, even has a dark history as far as the price that Christ had to pay because it cost him something. But redemption means that somebody must be ransomed and there's a price to pay for that ransom. What is the ransom price to be paid for our redemption? What is the price to be paid to redeem us and set us free? It cost Christ something. It cost him his life. You know, throughout the Bible, when someone is taken captive, and what you have was when kings began to have their treasury run low, they'd go and they'd conquer another king so they'd have all the monetary value and gifts and treasures the king they conquered had and they'd expand their kingdoms by going to conquer another king and then what they would do is they would bring back all the best of that society and somehow they would seek to try to involve them or initiate them into the present society but they'd leave those they called the riffraff, the scum, those who were of no count, they'd leave them behind. Just a case in point is an illustration. When Nebuchadnezzar goes and he raises Jerusalem, 
And he brings back these three young men along with Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, the recommendation of Daniel and those three friends is they were good looking. And because they were good looking, Daniel thought they could be educated. I don't know what the correlation is between good looks and education, but Nebuchadnezzar thought because they were good looking, they can be educated and they can be enfolded into our Babylonian society. We can teach them our ways and our language. Who's left? Who's left in Jerusalem? Who's left behind? All those who were not good looking. All those who were considered of no countenance or no value whatsoever. Well, what they would do is they would gather up all they could of any value and they'd try to gather enough value to go and redeem those who had been taken captive to bring them back again. Or it might be that a person had indemnified themselves and if they spent enough time working it off to pay for the indemnification, they might be set free because they put in the time to do that. Well, we don't have somebody that's going to be riffraff that's going to come save us. We're not going to put in the time to have our redemption handed to us. It's going to cost something. I know when I use this illustration that this illustration is tremendously, tremendously dated. But it is still a good illustration. When I was a boy, I remember when we had old-timey cash registers in which you would have the person that would have the goods that come by and you'd have that person that could do this and it'd ding and it'd do this and it'd ding and have this scanning stuff that took place. It was real, real people who waited on you and they looked at it and they gave the price and they put it in and so it went. But as they did that, when it was all, when it was all added up, when it all came to its sum total, there was another little dial over here on the right. And what that person waiting on you would do then is they would then dial up and out would come the number of green stamps that corresponded to the amount that you spent. Well, they gave books for green stamps. And what you would do is you would take those green stamps and my sibling and I always got in the contest if you got to lick the green stamps because the gum on the back tasted sweet. And then you would fill that green stamp book and you would take it to the green stamp store and you would do what they call redeem something. That's not our word. It's not okay. I've paid this for that. The idea of redemption is much more akin to the fact we put something in pawn. And so we put something in pawn to trade for something else and now we want that which of value and we go and we purchase it again. We redeem that. We buy that. Well, in Romans chapter 5, you have again this statement stated over and over again about a free gift and justification by grace that's called a free gift. It may be freely offered to me and you, but it wasn't free to Christ. It also wasn't free to Paul. You know, Paul will tell the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, I labored among you from the book of Ricky. I didn't charge you a single penny for this. I didn't ask you for a single dime for this. What I came to you, I gave you free of charge. Now, understand, Corinthians, that the Macedonians and the Thessalonians over here and the Philippians, they paid for this. They supported me in doing this. They paid the cost for this, but to you, it cost you nothing. It cost somebody when Paul came. And then there were times when Paul was by himself and he would make his living building tents and selling tents, but not only for Paul himself, he would do that for all those who traveled with him as well. Paul paid the price. It cost Paul something. It cost the Macedonians. Sometimes it cost Paul by building of his own hands. The gospel came free of charge to the Corinthians, but it was not free. Somebody paid for it. 
So is, is salvation really free? Is there no cost associated with it? Well, I would suggest to you there's a cost for us. And, and it comes in the form. It comes in the form of money. You remember that story about that rich young ruler that comes to Jesus? And he asked Jesus, what must he do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells that young man to go and sell, go and sell all that you have. There's a cost. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor. First of all, Jesus tells him, you keep all the commandments. And this young man's response is, I kept all those my youth up. Time out, pause. Maybe he might have missed one. That might have been one he just simply overlooked. Because it reveals what it is when Jesus says, you go sell all you have and you give to the poor. And the text says, he went away sorrowful. The emphasis of that text is not on the sorrowful. The emphasis of that text is he went away and it was sorrowful. He wasn't willing to pay the cost. Now we look at that and we like to tell that story, but we don't get too close to it because is the Lord going to require of me something I'm going to be asked to pay? It's not simply to pay the preacher. There's a cost to pay for the gospel being spread. It's gonna cost me something. But we're afraid what the Lord will do is ask us, go sell all you have and give to the poor. I ran across this little story. I want this pearl. How much is it? Well, the seller says it's very expensive. But how much? We ask, well, a large amount. Do you think I can buy it? Of course. Everyone can buy it. But didn't you say it was very expensive? Well, I have a few dollars in my pocket. How much? We start digging. Well, let's see. 30, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120 dollars. That's fine, what else do you have? Well, nothing, that's all. Where do you live? You're still probing. In my house? Yes, I have a house. The house too? He writes that down. You mean I have to live in my camper? Oh, you have a camper? That too? What else? I like to sleep in my car. You have a car? Two of them. Both became mine. Both cars. What else? Well, you already have my money. You have my house. You have my camper. You have my cars. What else do you want? Are, this, are you in this world alone? No. I have a wife and two children. Oh yes, your wife and children too. What else? I have, I have nothing left. I'm left alone. Suddenly the seller exclaims, Oh, I almost forgot. You yourselves too. Everything becomes mine. Wife, children, house, money, cars, and you too. And then he goes on. Now listen. I will allow you to use all these things for the time being. But don't forget, they're mine, just as you are. And whenever I need any of them, you must give them up because now I am the owner. And the Lord says, it's all mine. We may say we have a $1,000 and we'll give 10%. So I'll give the Lord 100, but the 900's mine. No, the 900's his too. It's all his. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? I love that story of Zacchaeus because he was a wee little man. And he wanted to see Jesus awfully bad. So he climbed up into a tree. I can't help but think that all those Jews watching that would have just had a great laugh if Zacchaeus had fell out of the tree and fell on his head and knocked himself out. They would have said that's not too good for him. But there was something special about Zacchaeus. Because you remember that our children's song? Zacchaeus, you come down here for I'm going to your house today. 
And do you remember what Zacchaeus said as Jesus is talking to him? I don't know that Zacchaeus had taken extortioning, by extortion money from people, but he said this, if I have done wrong, I will restore fourfold. Wait a minute. It was going to cost Zacchaeus something. Zacchaeus said, I'm willing to pay the price. I'll give fourfold. What, what if fivefold had been required of him? Do you think he would have argued over the fivefold? Sometimes we worry about somebody getting a job someplace where there's no Lord, where there's no church. And they say, but I, I'm, going to make, I'm going to make this much money. But wait a minute. What am I willing to give up to sacrifice being with the Lord? It's going to cost me something. It's going to cost us our life. In Philippians chapter 3, you have the story of Paul. As he begins to tell his, his story here, he begins to tell of what tribe he came from. He came from the tribe of Benjamin. That was special. He came from the tribe of Benjamin. He says, a Hebrew of Hebrew, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And I think what that means is, if there was a Hebrew, there was nobody more Hebrew than he was. If there was a Pharisee, there was nobody more Pharisee than he was. You did not get to be a Pharisee or a Hebrew greater than what Paul was. He was the Hebrew of Hebrew and a Pharisee of Pharisees. It's my own thought that Paul was being fast-tracked to be president of the Sanhedrin when the Lord met him on the road to Damascus and changed his life, turned it upside down. Do you remember what Paul said about all the things he possessed? Having to do with all of his heritage, it goes all the way back to, to Benjamin, to all the things that were there. He said all these things, notice, I considered, I considered but rubbish to be thrown on the garbage heap. All those things that would have been so special to a Hebrew, all those things that would have been so special to a Pharisee. He said, I, con I consider nothing but just trash to be thrown on the garbage heap. Are we willing to offer that, our life, to the Lord for that? For Paul, sacrificing being the tribe of Benjamin and being a Hebrew and a Pharisee, a keeper of the law, blameless by the law, is what he said. He was willing to give all that up. It cost him all of that, but he was willing to call it nothing but rubbish to be thrown on the garbage heap. In John chapter 5, I'm sorry, John chapter 15. We look at the first three verses of John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. Listen to how Jesus describes this. He said, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He's cast as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and shall be done to you. But by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so will you be my disciple. What's it going to cost? What's it, my, li my life, what's it going to cost? Regarding my life, what's it going to cost me? It's going to cost me growth. We really talking for John chapter 15 about bearing fruit. He's not talking there about personal evangelism and if you're not out teaching somebody and baptizing people, then you're not bearing fruit and you're going to die. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about being a disciple. He's talking about being attached to the Lord, abiding Him. You have this intimate, close attachment so that you don't separate the two. And he said, if you are in me, you will continue to grow. It's going to require something of us. Is salvation free? It's going to demand of me that I grow in Christ. When you turn to the book of Ephesians and you turn to chapter 4, 
And you look at all those things that are mentioned first in chapter 4 about the ones that are there. You come down to verse, to verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. For, that word for there is with a view to something. Why did he have these gifts? Why does he have these functions, these works? With a view to equipping of the saints in order to do the work of ministry or service. In order for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness and a deceitful plot. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things who is the head Christ. Why do you have these who are these administrators, these functions, these works? Why do you have apostles? Why do you have prophets? Why do you have evangelists? Why do you have pastors? Why do you have teachers? With a view to something. With a view of equipping saints to do what? To serve and to edify, to build up. Why? That we may grow up. That we may grow. That we're no longer tossed to and fro as the wind blows us about. But that we have a stability to us. That we might be a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we might be that perfect man, that complete person, may be in his image. All these things are asked of us so we can be transformed to be like him. It's going to require something of us. It's going to require that we grow, but not just grow, grow up in Him to attain that measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, to be transformed, to be like Him. It's going to cost us something. We're going to be asked to grow. Is salvation free? It's going to cost us some money. It may cost us our life. Turn to Romans chapter 1. There's one other consideration I'd like for you to think about with me here. In Romans chapter 1, I would suggest that we are debtors to the Lord. Salvation is not free. We are debtors to Him. Listen to what Paul will say, beginning in verse 20. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul will speak throughout his letters that he has a debt. He will say, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. We look at that and say, well, that's not us. The Lord did not put that up on me like he did Paul. But wait a minute. Why do I preach the gospel? Do I preach the gospel so, so I can receive a paycheck? Is that why I preach the gospel? No, I preach the gospel because I'm a Christian. Because I'm a disciple of the Lord. Being a disciple of the Lord doesn't mean I'm a preacher. I'm an evangelist because I'm a Christian. And I owe something to the Lord, but it's not just to be a preacher to owe something to the Lord. We owe, there's something, we, we owe a debt to the Lord. Maybe it's not like Paul says, woe is me if I don't. It's put upon me like that. The Lord put upon him, put that upon him. But there's, there's something that I owe the Lord. Did you see that in chapter one there? He says, because all they knew God, they did not glorify him. I have a debt to glorify God. Because I am his child. Because he has paid a ransom price for my redemption. Because he paid the cost that for me, salvation might be free as far as my relationship initially with him is concerned and sustained. But I owe him something. I have the responsibility to glorify him. When they knew him, they did not glorify him. To know him demands something. It demands we glorify him. But there's a second thing. It demands that we thank him. They did not glorify him, neither did they thank him. Of all people still in our society today that are reviled the most is someone that's an ingrate. 
How could we as people who are redeemed by the blood of Christ say anything more than thank you, Lord? I will praise you. I will glorify you. That is the least of what I owe you. I owe you that debt. But that's nothing for me to pay compared to what you have paid for me to have a free gift. I will glorify you. In Ephesians chapter 1, once again, in Ephesians chapter 1, when you begin in verse 3, you're down through verse 13, and in this you have seven spiritual blessings that are listed. I'm just going to read verse 3, and then we'll talk about the others for time's sake. But notice what he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Places is supplied. I think what he's saying is, Thanks be to God for every spiritual blessing. These are high, exalted blessings. They are celestial blessings. These are the highest that you can get. These are high, exalted blessings. They're special blessings. To be what? To be forgiven. To be redeemed. To be chosen. To be adopted. To have the manifold wisdom of God revealed. To share with Him as being one and to have the seal of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual blessings. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. These spiritual blessings are in Christ. These spiritual blessings aren't in the church. I'm not negating the value of being part of the church. The Lord adds us to that. These spiritual blessings are because of our relation, being in relationship with Him. Christ is the source of these spiritual blessings, not the saved. Being saved is a spiritual blessing. Blessed, thank God for these spiritual blessings in Christ. Thank God for being forgiven. Thank God for being chosen. Thank God for being redeemed. Thank God for being adopted. Thank God for having the gospel revealed. Thank God for being one with him. And thank God for the seal of the Holy Spirit. We thank him. I often ask myself, I'd ask you to think about this very same thing. In my prayer life, what is my prayer life filled with? Is my prayer life filled with give me, I want, please supply? I'm not diminishing the value of that whatsoever. Obviously, we lay our petitions and our needs before Him. Absolutely so. But how much time in prayer do we spend thanking Him for all He has supplied to and for us? And thanking Him for all those blessings that we have because of Christ. You see, we owe a debt too. We owe a debt to glorify Him. And we owe a debt to offer Him thanks. Is salvation really free? Well, if it weren't a free gift, we can't pay for it. And we're never going to be good enough to, to earn it. And since there's no free gift, there's not a price that we can lay down we could do that. It's free as far as salvation is being offered. It's free as far as what Christ has done for us and God provided. But it costs Christ his life. But that doesn't mean there's not something we owe him. Now, having said we owe him, please understand what I've said all through this lesson. That owe is in the sense of a debt, not in the sense of I'm going to pay you off. I owe him my life. I owe him transformation. I owe him glory and thanks. So next time we sing redeemed, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Remember, that redemption required a ransom price. And as a result, I bow before him. And as we say, we give him our all. There's nothing less. Thank God. Thank God for justification 
by grace. Thank God for the free gift. Thank God one man's offense did not doom the world because one man came to undo what that one man introduced into the world. And now, now, we can be saved by grace. Amen. And we can be right with God because our faith expresses itself by accepting from Him the conditions He offers for our salvation. And there's something this evening that one may need to do as a debt to God. Maybe you're in your sins and you're not in that abiding relationship that we talked about. And you want to begin that growth, that process. You can be baptized for the mission of your sins this evening believe Him to be the Son of God. You can change your mind about sin and about God. You can cry to all, He's my Lord. Or perhaps, just perhaps, we need to go to our closet and spend time in prayer to God. Whatever we can do by encouragement this evening to, to help you. We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.